Welcome to another episode in the series of Impact. So we have today a very special guest with us. She is an experienced educator, nursing practitioner. She has been a nursing education and training lead, accreditation consultant at Oakwood University. She is a lovely lady, very people person. She's a great cook, a wife who just celebrated her fourth anniversary, a great friend of mine. Um, and I just want to say we have Dr. Karen Lynch Freighter with us. Hello, Karen. Welcome. And thank you for joining us. Hello, Craig. Thanks for having me. It, it has been a while since we have uh, caught up, but, you know, I can't forget about those times when we used to have it, the mm -hmm. barbecues and all. We miss those days. Indeed, indeed, indeed. We were, we're talk, uh, my husband and I frequently talk about our very first cremation in London and then how that helped us, you know, develop into being better at, at, at doing barbecues. So that has, that was, that, those, were, those days were great fun. So yes. miss them. Now, Karen, um, for most people who might be watching and listening to us now, um, who is Karen? Tell us about um, who Karen is and your role in, in life. Well, Karen is a little girl who was born in, the, in, the, in rural Manchester in Jamaica and, um, you know, did high school and stuff and subsequently moved to London as, an, uh, as a young, very young adult, or yeah, very young adult, or so I thought. Um, <laughs> And I, I trained initially my early career, started as a registered nurse that I loved. And then I moved, I segued um, into nursing education. And from there, I worked with the NHS in the UK and they were, um, back then, you, you know, you get free tuition for, for, for development and training. So I jumped on that, you know, a little country girl, <laughs> develop and, and, and do well and make it, you know, do things my parents couldn't have done for themselves. And so they have invested me all these times. So yeah, I took the opportunity of developing and I moved off, as I said, into education. I did a master's in education back in the UK and then moved on to do a uh, a PhD and um, and yeah, from the, I moved up the ranks into education. My last job in, in London was the head of nursing education for medicine. And that was up to 2017 when I relocated to the US to, to, to marry my college sweetheart and my longtime friend of 30 plus years. Um, and, while I moved here, while we were setting up and trying to settle, I um, started a job at Oakwood as the accreditation um, consultant for the nursing department. And I worked to I worked with them up to June of this year and took a break um, trying to get some some publications done. Um, and you know, well, you know, with research and publications, though that takes time, yeah. effort, and you've got to be tunnel focused. Um, I just decided to to accept um, Oakwood's and not a job at Oakwood as, as a professor going in for um, for when the kids come back in January. Great. Um, you have been through the ranks and you have now, you know, move on and you're moving up to professor. Don't know what else will be there for Karen, but, you know, I'm always in interested to find out about Karen as a little girl. Tell us about the little girl Karen at primary school. Karen as a little girl. I was an on, I'm an only girl. So I have I'm between boys. I never played with dolls. So Karen as a little girl would climb trees, would hop trucks, would play cricket, would do all this stuff that the boys do, would both hop trucks and fall off trucks and break <laughs> hands and all of that. Um, you know, I, I would, my mother would, <laughs> I remember at my wedding, my mother told the crowd, <laughs> How much everything the boys did it's almost like I needed to 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 to, to top that yeah I'm always competing with the boys and 
a lot of people would think that because I'm a girl and, and, and middle the boy, you know, in the middle of boys, I'd be princess and treated, you know, with, with, with glove. But they never saw me as a girl. I, well, I, at least I don't think so. If they did, oh gosh. <laughs> but, you know, so we, we did boys stuff, playing marbles and, you know, we did boys stuff. And um, I was always... I was never girly. I, I was never really necessarily emotional. And I, I remembered my parents sending me to an all girls school for high school. That I think that was how desperate they got. They, they really <laughs> wanted to see, I, I, that's just my, my thought. Right. They really wanted to see, you know, to help me become very feminine and, you know, having the finer things of, 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 of being female never worked I was all I was into sports so athletics netball I played center for netball you know center to get all the bumpings around yes. and um athletics I I would go to um all those meets for girls champs and stuff and that came to a halt when girls champs was changed from Friday from Thursday Friday to Friday to Saturday to Friday and Saturday my mom said no it you know Sabbath and she had a hard time, of course, with, with the teachers. Why is she standing in a child's way and the whole shebang? But they were, you know, my, my I grew up as a Seventh Adventist. I was born into the Seventh Adventist family, and they um, they took Seventh Adventism um, and and church and you know seriously. So that ended my career in in athletics. So I, I guess from um, being with your, your brothers and doing all those boy stuff, I know you're very independent. You, you're very good with your hands on um, thing. You were able to fix things. Yes, sir. Now, yes. <laughs> I know you talk a lot about your parents and I'm going to come on to that. But while going to school, was there any teachers that had an impact on you, any, any influence on you? Yes. So... Um... There were two teachers. One had a very positive impact and one had a very negative impact. And so let me start with the negative impact first. The, 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 the chap that had a negative impact was my math teacher. I couldn't stand the guy. He was arrogant. He was rude. He was condescending. I don't know if it was, well, this is my view. It was an all girls school. We were young girls. You know, we really don't know anything much. And if you didn't do very well, he would talk down to you as if you'd become nothing. You know, you, oh, can you be so dumb? You know, and I never liked math as a result. I never liked math. I don't know how I passed math because I, I didn't like it. I didn't like the teacher. And I always looked at him and, I, you know, I, I remember talking a couple of weeks ago, I was in a, a Zoom call with, with some friends of ours who are, I tried to, to link all the guys from high school who have a PhD or a doctoral degree. And we, you know, we sort of met, you know, catch up sometimes to have a wee chat. And I remember my girlfriend saying to me, you know, this, I wouldn't call his name, but this chap, uh, let's call him Mr. T. He, um, because he always looked down and, oh, you, you, you rubbish and, and that's no good and whatever it made her, propelled her to do well in math. Like, I'll mm. show you. Yeah. I don't know if it propelled me because I got a two. I didn't get a one. I got a two in, in math. But um, I didn't like the man. And I told myself, if I ever became an educator, that's what I would never be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the person who really impacted me in high school was my PE teacher. And I can mm. call her name, Miss Kalia. She was tough. You couldn't fall and just stay there. She said, what do you think you're doing? It's, it's athletic. You will fall. Or it's lap ball. You'll get hit. Get up. Yeah. And, and so, you know, and at the same time, when she said it, you, you could laugh. <laughs> It's not that you, you, you know, she's not saying it and then you'll cry. You, you, she, she said it in a way that you would laugh and then she'll stretch her hand and you'll hold on to that hand. She'll pull you up. And she said, get on yeah. with it. Yeah. You know, and so that kind of zero then reminded me of a kind of principled person I had back home, my dad. Very similar. And maybe that's why I fell in love with her. But she, she toughened us up. She, she didn't allow us to be 
girls. Yeah. You know, you really toughened us up and 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 made us more resilient and and make us. You fall, you get up, you keep moving. You've got a game, you know. You've got a game. You've got te- you're you're a part of the team. Get on with it. You don't just fall in a you know in a team and and, and lay down because the team depends on you. So it's about how those teacher that, that teacher help you to focus with failures and you know move on, not feeling sorry for yourself or feeling little. Where as in the other teacher was more condescending, making you feel rubbish and, and i remember having teacher a teacher like that i didn't like the teacher for that reason i didn't like the subject and it's I, there's so many things that teachers can do to either break children or to motivate children you mentioned your dad tell us about your dad and how he moved you on he was a strict man i take it but he's your hero daddy my my gentle giant Daddy is about five foot six, not very tall, miniature, but he's my gentle giant. He, he was always a principled guy. Now, mark you, I grew up in a house where we never get a hug. Back then, getting a hug, I guess in my later years, you get that from mommy every ever so often, but daddy wasn't the guy to come and hug you. He was a provider. He was a prayer warrior. Every single morning, he'd ring that bell and you better get up for worship. Mm. And every single evening, he'd ring that bell and you better come up for worship. And, you know, I remembered growing up um we had when we had family worship we had what a little, little book we call the morning watch that mm-hmm. uh, we do these scriptures and he never just had us reading scriptures he had us read it and explain what we thought it was saying mm-hmm. and how how we thought it would impact our lives as we went out to school now i hated that that made no sense to me i just <laughs> wanted to be a child but as I got older and even now looking back, I realized, wow, that guy was wise. He was doing stuff that he knew would stick with us. Now, daddy, <laughs> daddy would have, would, have, would have frequent quarrels with us, especially with my brothers. But then, like I said, I grew up as a boy, so I didn't really feel like I was, I was you know, it wasn't about me. Yeah. But he taught me very early on that I was a leader. But he did that indirectly. Here's what he did. He was having a quarrel with my brothers. And he said to them, the kind of teaching that you all get in this house, nobody's children is bad company for you. You are bad company for people's children. Mm. That told me that very day, Karen, nobody can lead you anywhere. If anybody is doing the leading, you are. So I was not one of those kids, thank God, who ended up following, you know, Jamaica, following bad company or going down some some rabbit hole with with, with friends. If anybody was was following anybody, somebody was following me. It wouldn't be the other way around. And we, we, we often banter and talk about that. I said, you in your my dad was educated to maybe. I don't know. He went out to trade. What? I don't know. Apprenticeship. Yeah. They call trade then at, a, at age 12. So you, you're leaving school at age 12. That's a child. And you're leaving school to go learn how to do building and, con, you know, and, and stuff and carpentry and stuff with somebody. That's the level of education my dad had, you know. But that guy spoke into us even though sometimes it was it was quarreling because that's how he knew to do it right but he instilled in us resilience he instilled in us he, he instilled in us leadership qualities he instilled in us he gave us what he had he gave us the bible in the way he understood it and god allowed him to guide and protect and nurture his family in such a way that he will he is and will forever be my hero I mean, you, you have touched on so many things. I like the fact that as a child, you couldn't understand why. You didn't like these th- things, but you grew up to understand that this was genius from your parents. Uh, and, and it's a lot of children, I think, nowadays are not getting that in the home, but 
that the, and you can see the results of that. Now, as a leader, you I know you have you know gone through the rank and you have led. How did you rally back onto those training when in your leadership position, especially growing up in a in when you're in the UK and leading as a minority? Right. Okay. So um my dad wasn't the only guy, but the only father figure I had in my life. Um, so it, back in the UK, I remembered, I remembered um or pastor then, Pastor Will, Pastor Hamilton Williams, he and my parents were, were very close. And I remember my dad saying to him, I'm handing over the reins to you to be father to this child of mine. <laughs> and we laughed because I said to daddy, you're not trying to tell him that he could, he could slap me on the head you know, <laughs> or whatever. But I remembered, I, I remembered, um, applying for a job, leadership. And I, I was thrusted into leadership somehow. I was always asked to apply for a job. And I was always asked by my superiors. And I, so I learned very early on, if your superiors don't ask you to apply for a job, don't bother, nobody's yeah. giving you that job. And it must have been something that somebody would have seen in me to, to, to want me to, to, to do these jobs. There was something, I don't know, somehow I was always able to, to, to gather the flock, the nursing flock like sheep somehow. It, I don't know, I guess early on I became an influencer of some sort, but if we needed to get an audit or get some, some form of clinical practice changed to something better, I was usually the, the go-to person that people would come to. Right. So I get thrusted into leadership um, very early on. So I remembered working as a as a as a as a new recruit, um, not new recruit, as a new nurse for 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 a year before moving, you know, applying and moving into a, a more senior role. And within within that year, with that twelve months, I was already a junior sister. Yeah. So so that happened very quickly. Now, as a minority, I remembered very clearly. Now I worked at St Mary's Hospital in London. And St. Mary's Hospital is in the heart of London, where all the elites yeah. that's where they go for, the, 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 from, from, um, from Buckingham Palace to wherever. That's where they go. And I remembered wearing this dark blue uniform and going into a boardroom for a meeting, and I was the only person of my color yeah. in, that, in that boardroom. And what was strange is I was never nervous. I felt I could stand tall and, and, and speak. <laughs> ah, and I remember, it's almost like the people around me being shocked. It's like, like who do you think you are? I, it must have been that. It must have been, who do you think you are? Because sometimes I'd say stuff and it would be like, you could hear a pin drop in the room. Yeah. And I would be saying, well, you know, I've got concerns about that, or I think that maybe you could consider, or have you considered this, or have you considered that? And, you know, over time, I sort of started to learn how to navigate being in situations and like boardrooms or at work, the working um, world, where you are a minority, but you have to recognize that you also have a voice. I am now speaking for the thousands behind me who have not gotten there yet. So yeah. I had to put that cap on. Um, interestingly, however, lots of the pushback and challenges I got wasn't from white people. Mm. That's interesting. <laughs> It, 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 because you would you would think that you know being the leader and being um, there to represent uh, us uh, or the people of your um, race and culture would be easier, but they were the challenging one. Yeah, absolutely. And I found that I I must say I was young, but then it, it is angered young. me. <laughs> I was young. It angered me, and I didn't know how. I I had no back then. I had no filter. Yeah. So um, being young and getting pushback from your own, I would tell them off because I, I, it just didn't make sense at all to me, you know. But over time, 
over time with wise counsel. So that's how like Pastor Williams came in. I remembered ringing him up. I just, 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 just throw all the, all the stuff and says, can you imagine these people? Your own, your own. And he had a very calm demeanor. He never, ever gave me an answer. I cannot remember him ever giving me an answer. What he did, however, was quite similar to daddy. He would ask me questions. Mm -hmm. And Craig, that sat with me, that resonated so much with me. He would ask me questions and he would ask me some one about questions. Sometimes I wonder, what's you know, it was irritating yeah. because, but then I, I had to have the respect and I would, I would still listen, I'd go my way. And sometimes I pushed back, I would quarrel and argue and shout and I'd go about my business. But then it made me reflect. And I realized over time, when I had people come to my office to talk and blab and blurt and blurt, I found myself asking them questions. So I was using that same tactic that 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 Pastor Williams, I affectionately call him Papa. Yeah. I, I'd, you know, I I'd, I'd use that type of asking them questions, and I became the agony aunt. Because every Friday. My director and associate director of nursing would be in my office after they get, went to their big meeting with the CEO. They'd be in my office and they'd be just throwing it at me. And I would just sit there. I'd make them a cup of coffee or tea. And I'd just sit there and then I would ask them questions and help them process stuff. And they thought I was great and I was brilliant. And I'm like, if they ever even know. So, you know, it was me getting something from somebody who influenced me and helped me to grow as a leader. And not forgetting prayer. I remember going out every morning. I wouldn't go into deep prayer and devotions when I'm leaving home. Every right. morning I'm leaving home, I'd say, Lord, grant me wisdom. Guide my feet, guide my tongue, and guide my thinking. That was it. So, so you, you, you had a dad who influenced you and, and, and laid the foundation. You had Pastor Williams who helped you to, to, to mellow because I guess with your brothers, you had to be competitive and you had to argue your point being in the middle. I know you had pastor to help you, Pastor Williams to help you, to calm you down. Now, your mom, what part did she play? My mom, right. So remember I said, I wasn't a girly person. Yeah. So sitting down and talk to, right. So sitting down and talk, talking to my mom, didn't come naturally. I loved her and we talk about things, but if she got like personal, I'm gone. Mm. And I would sit and I would talk to my brothers or I would sit and I would talk to my dad about stuff, girl stuff. But if my mom come, came close, I was out of there. And I, I, I later reflected and I figured why. Now, of course, my parents, they got married very young. My dad was like, 19 my mom or 20 21 i think but yeah. my mom was a teenager late teenager so they got married very early my mom went back to school when i was moving from second second form to third form in high school so she went to western college western college back then right classes um and you know when you think of Erickson's developmental stages of man, those were the crucial times, my changing on period. I really don't know who I am. The right. the adolescent, the, the, that kind of changing up time. When that's the time, if you want to really gel and, and forge relationships with your daughter as a mother, yeah, that's the time you need to be there. Yeah, it's important to be there when they're going through, you know, what those puberty adolescent, th those young years when you're changing out and need to ask questions. I mean, she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And so it became, it just got natural that I stuck with the boys. I would talk to them. I would talk to them about anything from menstrual period to anything. And so I remembered when my mom came home and stuff and you know I, my dad I guess would tell her some of the stuff that we talked about and I remembered hearing her in her room crying once and like she was praying like lord what has she done you know and 
Um, but for me, I love her. It was just that the girly me telling yeah. you that this didn't happen. That but period of time had, had passed. Had passed. And, you know, but then later on, I would come and we'd be, we'll be, we'd be girlfriends. We'll, we'll be friends and we we'll talk about boys. We we'll talk about. So I remembered um, back in 1990 when I met Andrew for the, you know, when I met Andrew and around 91, Andrew came home with, you know, his cousin and I were, were, were study mates. We went to nursing school together and mommy loved him. And, you know, we'll just gel and he was my boyfriend and, you know, and we'll talk about those, those stuff. And um, yeah, so she, she she inst- she was a she was a brilliant cook yeah, i was just saying that you, was that where you got your cooking from yes she was a brilliant cook and i'd be around the kitchen looking and tasting and smelling and watching what she'd do and i remembered sometimes when my dad would be away and he'd be coming home my mom would say why don't you make a, a, a macaroni pie for, for your dad you know she'd give me the 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 she propelled me to do stuff and I, I remembered once I did a macaroni pie I don't know if you know these little finance yeah and I covered this thing up so nicely and when daddy came home from the airport the whole table full of hands <laughs> full of macaroni <laughs> you know so we laugh about those little things but um yeah she was an excellent cook and mommy never threw away anything if she did juicing, she used the pulp to make bread. She, if something, if the bread foot got ripe, she used it to make bread. If anything, and I realize that from London to now, if I do juice, anything, I, we, we got these grapes, the, these wild grapes called muscadine here. Yeah. yeah. And I, 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 I pulp them out and I do, I'm, I do muscadine bread. Andrew, my husband, doesn't like, there's some food he doesn't like. So like win, um, summer squash. Yeah. Kinda, I use it to make bread. Anything he doesn't like, I use it to make bread. I, he, I'm getting it down his throat one way or the other. <laughs> and, and he loves it, you know. <laughs> so I learned those culinary skills from my mom. Um, things like um, if a button fall off, you sew it back. You don't chuck it, you know. Um so, so those kind of fine skills within the house and around the house, I, I learned from. She was a very clean and, you know, she religiously every Thursday, and she still does it, every Thursday she'll be cleaning the house and mopping and dusting, and I get into that same habit. So, And, and did, you, did you think that you were learning these skills or was it just, um, you know, you were just hanging around? That's it. I she never called me and said, "Come, I'm teaching you this." Yeah, she'd be just there doing stuff, and she'd call me to say, "Come, come, come! I'm doing whatever." Greater than the spoken up, you know. And while you're in there with her doing stuff, or 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 pass or sieve, she sieve this for me while I'm doing that, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so while I'm, you know, while you're there, you you you, you get to, to 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 learn stuff. What about the boys? Were they involved? Your brothers were they involved as much? And are they as great cook as you? My the two first um the two first the two two first boys my first and second brother right. um oh yeah 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 they 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 my first brother especially is an excellent cook the second one helps himself um Jason boils stuff the last one he boils stuff he he's he can he can cook to save his life <laughs> not sure for the others of us <laughs> but yeah but Jason the last one he was like six years um younger than me so. I don't think there was any plans for him to be around. He was like that surprised child. Okay. Now, um, I, I, anybody who knows Karen, she is she loves cooking, and, and you know, I've I've been at the table so many times, and I really and miss seeing all just seeing pictures now, Karen. I, I must say, you know, you make me hungry every time I look at your your, your pictures. But you talk about. You know, you have gone through the rank and you now uh, aiming and heading for being a professor at Oakwood University. How did you get that um, hunger for education? Who was it that impacted you, and what you know caused you to always be aiming for greater heights? Okay, so when I when I went into nursing school, 
when I chose nursing initially, I didn't want to become a nurse. But very early on uh, back then, nursing was free. Mm. My parents had four of us. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no telling that my dad was the was the breadwinner. And for me, I needed to get to do something, a career that would be less um, costly on my parents. I would have a salary at the end of that and I could use a salary to become whatever I wanted to become. So that's how I went into nursing. So when I got out of nursing, I decided that my initial plan was to graduate, move to London um, and go and do law. So I had all the support from a very good friend of mine who was one of our consultants at the hospital I worked, who put me onto the right people in England and stuff and stuff. And I was going to go to law school. However, I think the Lord had something else for me. Hmm. When I went to St. Mary's, within 12 months, I, ha- I was promoted twice. Hmm. Uh, as a young person, that money was good so yeah. i was very happy moving up to the ranks um getting far better pay i said me me ain't going to know spend no money going to no law school when i you know i'm already it seemed as if my career was going somewhere yeah um it was a it was a it was a chap from a, one of the professors one of the clinical educators from one of our universities who said to me karen the students are always um, evaluating you very positively. You never met, make them slack up. You always help them to pull the bootstrings up, but you always do it kindly and they learned a lot. Why don't you do education? And I just, <laughs> that was it. I just made this big laugh and I was, all, I was on my way. You know, I went on my way. And the following week, he came back with an application form. He said, can you, can you complete this out for me? Get down to, 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 to your nursing um, office and have your, your deputy director of nursing for, who's responsible for education, have her sign it off. I'm like, okay. So I just did it. And quite honestly, there was no aspiration. There was no aspiration there at all. I did it because, yeah, you know, do it. Like get it off my back. Yeah. I did it, got it down to Catherine. And she says, oh, brilliant. I was thinking of asking you, but I, I wasn't sure how you'd take it. So I said, okay. So I went, it was a free master's degree. So I went and I did it. And I, I completed that. And I remember the chap saying to me, now you've got to publish the work. Just have you, you know, so I was there mulling around thinking I'm going to publish work. I need to have, I need to do a PhD. I didn't really understand what, I honestly did not know what a PhD was. Yeah. I didn't understand it. I didn't realize it was going to be hell difficult. It was hard. You know, you, you're not thinking about, you're young. You're not, well, I could just do it then. Um, and off I did, I signed up for, for, for the PhD. I said, well, if I'm getting it free, why not? So I signed up for it. And I then I realized, a PhD is not a master's and you're in full-time work. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. And um, I remembered working with you. I remembered working with you um, in personal ministries and anything I throw myself, anything I decide to do, I throw myself into it. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, I'm doing this travel, which takes up my time. I'm in full-time employment. I'm doing a PhD that I can't tell anybody about. <laughs> I couldn't because I had gotten to that phase in my life where I realized not everybody is happy yeah. with success. So it's almost like I'm on the ground doing this PhD while trying to navigate life. But then, you know, that God promised to bless and, and protect and guide me. And so, yeah, but I got to the phase where I said, I was asking myself, why did I want to do law? And I guess I wanted to do law with my background of being very, very competitive. I wanted to have that power and authority to to, to change things. And I, as I processed it, I remember I was talking to daddy and he said, you know, It is so important for people 
to be educated, to be taught the right things yeah. by the right people. He was telling me things, like he was like a pro prophetically telling yeah. me. And I'm listening to him talking to me and I'm reflecting on that. I said, hmm, that means education could allow me to have that impact. Yeah. Education could allow me that authority and power to change and support and help people the way that they need to be helped. And so I think much later on, I realized, well, okay, I could do this. So I, I applied for a job was going as the head of nursing educate head of education and i remembered i remembered um texting richard delissa and he was like a big brother and i text i said richard you know i'm going for this this job in this job and I'm, I'm really really wondering and he said these he texted these words back he says whatever is for you hmm. cannot be on for you that was it yeah that was it and I never looked back so I I I was able I got the job and I was able you know you get lots of pushbacks just the same but by now I have developed a voice by now I have developed some maturity with some filter so I wasn't going off the rails and telling people off anymore yeah um and with that level of maturity I you know, I was able now to, to navigate better, to, 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 to have more, a better impact on policy development and, and shaping policy. Um, so I realized, that, yeah, that must have been what God had for me in a roundabout way. It, it, it's interest, interesting when I listen to you, you always talk about having that person to go to um just remind us how important to have someone who you can always share your dreams with but at the same time get wise counsel from getting wise counseling i mean uh, you you hear this the, the, this term no man is an island yeah there was one phase and stage in my life where i feel i was invincible mm -hmm. i was totally independent and i needed no one that was a life from the pit of hell. But <laughs> back then, I didn't know that, you know. And you realize as you process stuff, sometimes you need to remove, take off some of those stuff from the vacuum, place it on the table and say, Craig, what do you think about this? Yeah. Because a different perspective, sometimes you can't see what others see. Others saw leadership in me. I didn't care. I didn't really, it wasn't an aspiration of mine. Yeah. So I'm not saying I didn't see it. I didn't see it because I wasn't looking for it. I didn't have an interest for it. But somebody else saw and sort of not, not, not propelled me, but sort of encouraged me to, to you know, and, and we need those in our lives. And I guess because I've had the experience of those, I try to be that. Yeah. So, for example, I remembered for um, I remembered for my PhD, for example, none of my supervisors understood my methodology because the school did not have expertise in my methodology. Hermeneutic, mm -hmm. I was doing hermeneutic phenomenology, and the school did not have an expert. Okay. But I was being guided on a rabbit hole that I should never have gone down. And when the school finally got somebody, and how they, how I ended up, I, how the school, when the school finally got somebody, it was because somebody was off sick and I needed somebody to read my work. And my supervisor, who didn't have a clue, said, Do you mind if I ask Leslie to have a look? And I said, Please. I said, You could give it to her if you want. Because by now I was really. Yeah. And he came on board at a critical point. I rewrote my PhD everything in 18 months hmm. i rewrote and i realized how far off the mark i was and coming here i had some students um some seniors who were failing and uh, uh, one of the professors um that time i didn't have my 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 NCLEX, so i wasn't um i i couldn't practice nursing as it were right but I work under somebody 
And I remember this lady saying to me, you know, I have some failing students who I, I think you could help. And I remember saying to this girl, she, this girl said to me, you know, Dr. Frita, how do you like that? We don't get people like that. And mm. I'm like, what? People who genuinely want to help and you, you, you'll shake them by the shoulder in a, in a roundabout kind of way. I said, I'm doing for you what somebody else did for me. Yeah. And every time I think of Leslie, Craig, Leslie is not the typical. Leslie is a lesbian. Leslie, <laughs> she's a lesbian who is married to a woman with children, you know, and they have children and stuff. Right. I said, is a lesbian? Don't, you know, you're Adventist and she's not a Christian and whatever. But I, 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 I've never met a kind of soul mm. genuinely interested in my development and my success. Never. Genuinely. A white woman who don't know me from Adam. You know, and, I, and so given my dad, Pastor Williams, the Leslie's, my mom, other people who've been there, who've, who've passed through my life and dropped Little, little crumbs for me to learn with. Even you, when yeah. I worked with you and I saw how composed you are and I'm thinking, I will fly off the bat like a crazy. <laughs> I had no filter. I really didn't care. And you would be so calm. So all of you, I've, 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 I've gotten little crumbs from that formed and that, that has helped to remold and reshaped me into the calm, composed, relaxed person I am now. <laughs> and 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 um, I mean, we all we all have to deal with different type of people. And yes, it was great the times we are spent together working and being the other side of Karen, having to be the calm one and you. But you know, it's it's all about learning. It, it helped me a lot, and you know, it those were great times. You are now in a place where you are impacting others. You have had the impact on your lives and you're impacting others. And you have clearly stated so many times in this uh, conversation about how the, the influence that others had on you and how by people seeing in you the leadership or the leader in you, they were able to do because it's about your life, how you live your life. Even though you were off the rails, but there was something in you. Now, you have recently married and um, how have you used your experience from seeing your dad or seeing Pastor Williams and a wife and other couples in your relationship now? Um, <laughs> for our marriage, we, when we met initially, we were kids. We met and dated as kids and then we went our separate ways. When we reconnected, we were now mid-career professionals who have lived our own lives. So that was a challenge. That had its own blessings, but that also had its own challenges. Okay. It's understanding. So I guess if you're married at 18 and you both had nothing and you're building together and stuff, it's one thing. But then when you already have a, you're both two established people mm -hmm. merging in a house let alone merging in a house to 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 coin that into a home that has its had its challenges yeah but my personality and andrew's personality complements each other i'm a frank open talker so and i i i'm not a well I am a very shy person. <laughs> I don't know that. But I'm a very shy person. I'm, I'm, I'm borderline introvert. If I know what I'm talking about, you can't shut me up. Mm -hmm. But I'm very tentative when I walk into a room. People thought, even at church back in London, a lot of people thought I was aloof because when church is over, church has A, and men out <laughs> in the town have been gone. I didn't hang about, but in terms of Andrew is 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 more quiet. I am more outspoken. So when we when we when we met when we reconnected, 
we had a good frank open conversations yeah of expectations for example of i wouldn't say ground rules because it's almost like we're kids but mm-hmm. expectations yeah what we really liked, what were our, our pet peeves? We understood that we were two flawed people coming into a relationship that would be living forever. And we established this very early on. Once we knew we were going in the direction of a marriage, we established that divorce is not an option. Yeah. So when we established that, we then moved down to the next level of saying, so you either want to choose to live happy or unhappy. Choose. Yeah, And so we now had to unpack what that happiness meant and how to move forward in it. And if we were going down a road where it was leading to unhappiness, somebody would take the charge and cap it. And I found that that really, really worked. We don't make assumptions. So I, I, I guess at some point in me, the, the feminine part kicked in, I think, where I expected Andrew to read my mind. <laughs> and I realized that, you know, mind reader. Yeah. So we had to go back to the drawing board. We have gone, we have had to go back to the drawing board a, a couple of times and reflect and pray about it and, and to, to move past barriers. Um, growing up, I, I saw my dad as the provider and mommy always make sure food was on the table and clothes were washed and, and ironed and stuff. Now this girl don't iron. This girl don't <laughs> me. <laughs> so, you know, it's establishing those little things from very early on. I said, yeah. maybe, maybe you thought that I'd be ironing. It ain't gonna happen. So let's, let's see what, you know, so, so we understand. So Andrew, I'm just work clothes are, are wash and go. <laughs> we ain't playing that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it's those things. So I, I love to cook and Andrew loves to eat. So I know the kitchen is mine. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and there's no competition you know, there, I'm sure. <laughs> we understand. We understand that outside belongs to him and inside belongs to me. So I dress the inside, he dressed the outside of the house. You know, so it, it, it's, it's, it's having, is knowing what our roles are. And one of the key things I've in, in for our relationship, for our marriage, is we used to do, I we used to do the tradition of having morning and evening worship. Morning worship being gonna work. It didn't work for morning worship after a while because Andrew is not a natural morning person. Yeah. So we realized if we're gonna get anything out of worship as a family unit, then we do family worship in the evenings. But one key thing I always liked and admired, I find really sexy. It's a man that prays over me. Mm. So I'd be doing something like, I'd be up in the study and he could hear me from maybe four o'clock in the morning going up the stairs and saying, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. And if I'm writing a paper or something and he'd come up and he'd just stand, put his hand over me and pray over me. And for me, that that is that is something that is something it gives me my prep in my steps it, it propels me to to move mountains for the day husbands you have heard it from dr karen lynch freighter pray over your wife that's sexy she said <laughs> karen we're almost going to an end and i just want to um a few more things i want to catch from you in terms of your growing up, um, I know you read a lot and you have read. Was there anyone in uh, public life that have impacted you and have given you that courage to move boldly in life? I could think of, oh my goodness, I can't really think of straight off the bat of my, of my head at the moment. But there's a chap who writes a lot about leadership, effective leadership. Um, I can't remember, I, I know I have his books. I can't remember his name right now. Um, but you know, and if anything around anything around development and reworking and maintaining focus, anything around um supporting and propelling people to to do better or to be a better version of themselves. Anything around strategies for for development and upliftment and and, and fulfillment. 
I, I was always drawn to. I was always drawn to anything that gives me some, that helps me to grow um, and gives me anything wisdom wise. Yeah. I, it's easy for me to say the, yes, the Bible, but yeah, the Bible is great, but outside of the Bible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any, anything leadership management development wise, I've always. Um, so um, apart from that, no, Karen, what do you do when you're on your downtime to for fun? Hiking. I love to go to the mountains. Um, we yeah we like we like to just go out and we have like you could hike caves. Yeah. We like doing the caves and we like going up go, going into the mountains and we do we do walking trail. Since COVID, um, Andrew is always working out. So since COVID, I've converted my side of the garage into a gym. So we work out together sometimes. You have always been working out from ever since, Karen. So I know you hit that came quite natural <laughs> what about um uh, music you love to listen to well um i go my kind of music is seasonal like today was a barris hammond kind of day so yeah. we you know i i have barris hammond on in the den all all morning andrew and i were back to back tidying up cleaning up together so he was doing something else and I was doing something else. So, yeah. But outside of, I like a bit of jazz sometimes. Um, when I'm working out, it's all high-tempered soca or old-time reggae, that kind of thing. I don't understand what they're saying, but it gives me the beat that I need to work out. Um, if it gets vulgar, then I know I have to dismiss it. <laughs> 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 is there i know you you cook everything and anything kind but what's your favorite food i never got that from you oh do you know i think my favorite is have have, have i think my favorite is curry chicken mm. curry curry anything curry but curry chicken and curry go i think yeah i think anything curry i don't know what is with me and this curry but yeah curry chicken and curry go and, and um, Karen, finally, before we say goodbye, what next for Karen? Well, um, I've previously traveled, done some, some world travel. And when Andrew and I were courting, we said he, he hasn't done a lot, a lot of world travel. So he has done a lot of traveling for work, but he would go to a city, to the hotel, do whatever work he needs to do back to the airport and back home. Yeah. He's never so. What we hope and plan to do is to get. We had planned to get some to do Australia last year, but then COVID hit and we couldn't. But we want to do some travels with with, with him as a couple. So I said this time I don't have to do selfies. I'll have somebody to take my pictures for me. <laughs> and one last word you would give to anyone listening and um, watching. We're just wanting to know how to navigate life and, you know, to be an impact or to be impacted. What would you say? If you ever want to be impactful, um, listen to your inner self. Ask God for wisdom. Listen to your inner self. Know who your inner circle is. And never be unequally yoked. Unequally yoked does not necessarily mean somebody who's of a different faith. For me, it means somebody who does not share the same values as you do. So keep focused, ask God for wisdom, know who your inner circle need to be. And your inner circle doesn't be, need to be this. That's why it's called inner. Yeah. Well, you have heard from Dr. Karen lynch Freto. Keep your inner circle inside, not to be too big. It was good catching up with you, Karen. And we look forward to the next phase of your life where the little ones start coming along. <laughs> I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you are making an impact by your living. So live right and be an impact for others. Until our next series, we'll say goodbye.